Uh, Our text for this morning is the first verse of Romans chapter 12. The Apostle Paul says, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. This morning I want to talk uh, again on the subject of worship and to show you that all our life is to be a life of worship. The problem that we have today is that if we were to ask the question, what do we mean by the term worship, we would probably get the answer, it's a service, specifically one that we hold on a Sunday Lasting for about an hour, beginning at 10 and ending at 11, maybe 11.15 if the preacher is long-winded. But that's a very narrow understanding of the word worship. And if we were to press a little bit further in that question uh, as to what happens during that worship service on a Sunday morning, in the minds of most people that gather in churches today, That service is designed for their entertainment. James Montgomery Boyce, when questioned about the subject, gives us this description of many modern-day worship services. He says, In the vast majority of church services today, there are virtually no pastoral prayers, while there is much brainless music, chummy chatter, and abbreviated sermons. Preachers are told to be personable, to relate funny stories, to smile, and above all, to stay away from topics that might cause people to become unhappy and to leave the church. Preachers are to preach to felt needs, not necessarily real needs. This generally means telling people only what they want to hear. And as we're about to discover from this passage in the book of Romans, that is not what worship is all about. In fact, when we come to God's word, we find that worship is more than just something that we do for an hour on a Sunday morning and again on a Sunday afternoon. We find that actually our whole lives are to be lived in worship of the Lord. And our biblical understanding of worship is that it's not a one-hour service in which we are entertained by the preacher, but it's all our life. George Swinnock, the old Puritan, said, Worship comprehends all that respect which man owes and then gives to his maker. It's a tribute that we pay to the King of Kings, whereby we acknowledge his sovereignty over us and our dependence upon him. It's all of that inward reverence and respect and all of that outward obedience and service to God. Our whole lives given in worship. Worship is our entire life. And so when we come to Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, we find Paul speaking There at the end of that verse of that which is our reasonable service. And he's not just referring to a specific hour between 10 and 11 on a Sunday morning. He's speaking about our entire lives lived in devotion to God and given in service to him. In which we seek to worship God inwardly with reverence and fear and outwardly with obedience and service. Why should we worship God? Well, let's look at this text and see what it has to say to us. And we begin then with Paul's appeal. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren. I urge you, I beg you, I exhort you. Now let's remember Paul was an apostle of Jesus Christ. He he is placed in a position of authority within the church. 
He has power under God. He could have enforced these things. He could have made it a commandment, but instead he appeals to them because he wants them to do this not out of duty or obligation, but out of love for their Savior. And he appeals to them to present their bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto God. Now, he does have a reason for doing this. And that reason is found there in the first line of the verse with his use of the word therefore. I've said it before, but I'll say it again. When we see a therefore in the scripture, we should ask why the therefore is therefore. It has a reason, it has a purpose. So what is Paul referring to when he says, I beseech you therefore? Well, he's making reference to what he has already given to them. This is the conclusion of his argument based upon the points that he has previously made. Let me sum up very quickly what has happened already in the preceding 11 chapters. Chapters 1 to 3 in the book of Romans, we learn the fact that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That we are all destitute of hope before God. We are all guilty uh, before Him. That's chapters 1 to 3. Then chapters 4 through to 11, we find the great plan of God's redemption given to us. We learn of the Savior who has been given, of his death upon the cross, of our forgiveness from our sins, the removing of the wrath of God. All of these things done by God's grace and his mercy. And Paul says, therefore, in light of all of these things, our response to the great saving work of God should be that we present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy, acceptable unto God. That's what he's saying here. That's the reason for this appeal. He's referring back to the message of the gospel. That Christ has died for our sins. Was raised for our justification. That we've received a righteousness from God. That we're clothed in the glory and beauty of Jesus Christ. That we've been given access to the very presence of God. And we now can come and worship and adore him and praise him and live for him all the days of our life. And you'll notice that Paul makes his appeal on the basis of the mercies of God. Live your life as one of devotion to God because of the mercies that God has shown to you. And you'll notice that he says mercies. We haven't just received mercy we have received mercies. It's in the plural. And he's emphasizing the fact that we have received great mercies from God. Literally, he's saying we have received mercy, mercy. Paul describes our Heavenly Father in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3 as the Father of mercies. And the God of all comfort. It is God who is the source of all of these mercies. Left to ourselves we are in the most miserable and pitiable condition imaginable. We are in our sins and under judgment of God. But we praise God this morning. That he is the father of all mercies and the God of all comfort. And wave after wave after wave of mercies have descended upon us. And God has delivered us from that awful condition of our sin. And has placed us into Jesus Christ. And has made us sons and daughters of God. And inheritors of his grace and of his glory. He has lifted us out of the pit of sin. He has seated us in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Surely, in light of all of these things, Paul says, we should be presenting our bodies as living sacrifices, 
holy and acceptable unto God. It's in light of that amazing grace and mercy that we've come to worship God today. How great is the mercy of God extended towards us. And that mercy, Paul says, is our motivation to worship God. When we think of all that he has done for us, our hearts should melt within us and cause us to serve and worship God with all that we are and with all that we have. We read a wonderful story in Luke chapter 7 of a sinful woman who came and at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ began to wash those feet. Now there were those that criticized. There were Pharisees there that day that criticized the Lord Jesus for allowing this woman to wash his feet. And the reason was she was a great sinner. Her life previously before meeting with the Savior was one of gross and great sin. And they wondered at the Savior allowing this woman to come and approach him and to touch him and to wash his feet. The Lord Jesus had this to say in verse 47. He says, I know that this woman was a great sinner. But her sins have been forgiven. And he then reminds them that those that have been forgiven much will love much. So if we have any problem worshipping God and serving him, just remember back to how much you have been forgiven. What great sinners we were in the sight of God and what great mercy he has extended toward us. And when we begin to understand those things and to remember them again, there should well up within us that great love for God that we'll want to serve him and love him with all that we have. It's part of the reason that we don't worship God the way that we should. Not the fact that we have lost sight of the great mercy of God in saving us. In Isaiah 51 and verse 1, we read these words. Hearken to me, listen to me, pay heed to what I have to say. Ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord, look unto the rock Whence she are hewn, and to the hole of the pit, whence she are digged. You know what he's saying there? He says, Remember where you came from. Remember that deep pit of sin, that merry clay from which the Lord delivered you. Remember it. And may it be a cause of rejoicing in your heart today that the mercy of God, that unmerited favor of the Almighty, has been extended to you. That God in his grace has reached down and plucked you out of that merry clay and set your feet upon the rock, the Lord Jesus Christ. He has plucked you as a brand from the burning. He's delivered you from destruction. Oh, the great mercies of God. Let that be your motivation, Paul says. That's his plea this morning. That's his appeal. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, He makes his appeal. And what is it that he appeals for us to do? Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Here's his plea. Present your bodies. Now the word present, well, we know what a present is. It's a gift that we give to someone. And the word that Paul uses here means Something that we set before God. Present your bodies to God. Make it a gift. We who were formerly slaves to sin, having been redeemed and set free by the Lord Jesus Christ, we are now to offer ourselves to God. You see, when we were slaves to our sin, we offered ourselves wholly, completely, To our sins. We served sin wholeheartedly. We gave ourselves completely to unrighteousness. 
We were full of sin from the crown of our head to the sole of our feet. We were sinners outwardly and inwardly. Everything that we did and touched was corrupted with our sinful nature. We gave our whole selves to sin. But now that we have been delivered from sin, we are no longer slaves to sin. We are now servants of God. Should we not give him the same wholehearted, complete service that we gave to our sins before he delivered us? Christ has set us free. And in this newfound freedom, he encourages us to voluntarily give ourselves in servitude to the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll find that when you read through the New Testament, all of the apostles, Paul, Peter, James, John, they all refer to themselves as the servants of God. And the word that they use is slave. They've placed themselves into complete servitude to their Lord and Master. And we are exhorted beseeched and encouraged to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. Our Savior presented himself as a sacrifice for us, making atonement, paying the price of our sin, taking away the wrath of God that was against us. His sacrifice was substitutionary. It was a propitiatory sacrifice. It removed our sins. It brought about our salvation. The sacrifice that you and I are being asked to make is not a sacrifice for sin. It's a sacrifice of thanksgiving. It's our response to God for what he has done to us. It's our gratitude. And what is it that we are to present? Our bodies. Our bodies. We're not primarily to present our money or an animal sacrifice. We are to present ourselves. Now I know that God's people are very generous. And that's proper and right within its place. But the first gift that God desires from us is not the money that we have in our pockets, but Our whole lives. God's primarily interested not in our giving of our tithes and offerings. But in the giving of ourselves. All that we are. Lived for the glory of God. If you look back into chapter 6 and verse 13 of the book of Romans. You notice that Paul gives this admonition to the believers He says, neither yield ye your members as instruments or tools of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments or tools of righteousness unto unto God. Give your body as an instrument or a tool to the Lord for him to use. For whatever purpose he he desires or demands. We've sang already about the giving of our hearts and our lives and our minds and our tongue and our hands and our feet. In the service of the Lord. To place them all at his disposal. Here's what Paul prayed for the church at Philippi. That Christ shall be magnified in my body. Whether it be by my life or by death. Philippians 1 and verse 20 and 21. God magnified in my life. He's talking about serving God in every aspect of his life. And even in his death if that's necessary. So we must present our bodies as living sacrifices unto God. And the tense of the verb suggests to me that Paul is speaking not so much about a a once made sacrifice but an ongoing lifelong sacrifice of ourselves unto God that everything and every day is done in worship to the Lord he says in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 31 so whether ye eat or drink or whatever you do 
Do all for the glory of God. Every aspect of our life lived in service for our Savior. The Lord desires our bodies given in sacrifice to him. Living sacrifice. The Lord is not asking for dead sacrifices today. Now there will be some believers in parts of the world that will lay down their lives for the Lord and for his testimony because of persecution and opposition to the gospel. That's not likely to happen here in Tasmania or throughout Australia. We are asked rather to give ourselves as living sacrifices. To live for God. To live for his service, for his worship. To give ourselves unto him wholly, completely, wholly nothing back. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. Live each day for God. And as we do that, may our living sacrifices be holy sacrifices. Separated unto God. Sanctified and fit for the master's use. What's the purpose of God's redemption? To make us holy. The blood of Christ was shed to remove our sins and to make us holy in the sight of God. So that we could approach him and come before him and worship him acceptably. And our sacrifice of our lives must be a holy sacrifice. Ephesians 1 and verse 4 says, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, for what purpose? That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. It is God's purpose in electing us and in saving us that we should be conformed unto the image of our Savior Jesus Christ. We are instructed in the scriptures that we are to be holy because the Lord is holy. Let us present ourselves as holy sacrifices, washed and cleansed in the blood of Christ and daily set apart for the master's use. So we see firstly Paul's appeal and we see the presenting of our bodies. And the last thing we notice in our text this morning is the pleasing of God. These things, Paul says, the presenting of our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto God, this is our reasonable service. This is pleasing and acceptable unto God. There's only one question that we must ask when we come to worship. Does my worship please God? Isn't that a wonderful question to ask? Does my worship please God? You know what happens so often after church services these days? The question is asked, how did you like the service? What did you think of the service? Oh, the singing was very nice. And I enjoyed the community and the fellowship. And the message was, well, it was a bit long, but it was okay. What did you think about the service? How did you like the service? Do you know what the problem with the, that question? It's man-centered. It's man-centered. Do you know the question we really should be asking after this meeting and service is over? Did my worship please God? Not did the service please me, but did my worship please God? Because that's the purpose for which we have been redeemed. That's what Paul says here. This is the purpose that the mercies of God have been shown towards you. This is the reason that you've been delivered from your sins. That you might present your bodies as living sacrifices that will be holy and acceptable, pleasing unto God. This is your reasonable service. This is the accepted worship that God expects from us. This is the purpose for which you've been saved. Did your life, your worship, your service, did it please God? Was it acceptable to Him? Was God pleased to accept my praise, my prayer, my singing, my giving, 
my preaching and my hearing of the word of God? Was he pleased with my repentance and my confession and my devotion and my self-sacrifice unto him? Is God well pleased with my living sacrifice of service for him? What about my service and sacrifice as a father or as a husband or as a wife or a mother or a son or a daughter? What about my spending of my money, my, my entertainment habits, my work, my study? Is God pleased with my sacrifice my offering of myself to him in all of the areas of my life? That's the question we should be asking. Have I truly presented my body as a holy, living, acceptable sacrifice and service for Christ? While I was still in my sin, I served sin with all that I had. Now that I am in Jesus Christ, do I serve him with all that I have? This is our reasonable service. This is the purpose for which I have been redeemed. This is my true act of worship. A giving of myself, not just for an hour on a Sunday morning, but every day, every moment of every day, a perpetual living Holy sacrifice. That's the reason that God has saved. That's the purpose. True worship is not about how we feel after an hour of meeting with one another on a Sunday morning. It doesn't consist of laughing or barking or crawling on the floor or shaking in some uncontrollable uh, fit. It's not mere emotionalism. True worship is that spiritual activity of the whole being of man being led in his understanding to a whole worship of God. It's our entire life. Our, our entire life is to be a life of worship. The Lord is calling us to dedicate ourselves to him. Every aspect of ourself, our mind, our intellect, our talents, our gifts, our abilities, our hands, our feet, everything to his service. To live each day for the glory of God, Monday through Saturday as well as, as the Lord's day. And if we live our lives in this way, that means that when we come together for public worship, Imagine how wonderful it will be. Lost in the worship and praise of God. Coming in adoration. Because of our lives. We have sought to live for his glory all the week long. And we'll look forward to these times when we meet with one another. And we'll lift our hearts towards the heavens. As we sing and we pray and we praise. And we'll testify to the Lord. That his goodness and grace towards us have challenged us and convicted us and encouraged us and motivated us to live each day for his glory and then the things that we do on the Lord's day when we gather for worship here within this house will simply be an extension of the worship that we've been engaged in all week that we'll worship the Lord truly with every part of our being. And God will find that worship to be acceptable. Our reasonable service. That's what's demanded from us. That's what's expected from us. A giving of ourselves wholeheartedly unto the Lord. Everything that we do seen as an act of worship. And then when we come together to worship in the church, we will then go out and worship in our day-to-day -day lives, in the things that we say and do, in the people that we meet. And all will be for the glory of God, our reasonable service, our entire life.
live for his glory. May the Lord help us to live our lives as an act of worship unto his name, so that in all that we do, our eating, our drinking, our uprising, our down-sitting, our going out, our coming in, every part of it lived in devotion to God, for his glory and for his praise. May the Lord help us to offer such worship unto him. Amen.